Okay, today's sermon, we are going through Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. And if you remember last week, Paul returns to Jerusalem. Oh, last time when we looked at Acts 21, remember Paul returned to Jerusalem. You know, he was, um, you know, they were upset that he was here. They dragged him out of the temple, you know, and then he got beaten up. They had to break it up. Now he's being carried up these stairs. He's beaten. And now he wants to address the crowd, which is what we see here in Acts 22. In Acts 22, we see Paul responds to this hostile crowd of Jews. And uh, we can draw a few lessons, but um, there's kind of quite a few interesting things happening in this chapter that I will go through this morning. So let's start off with the first section where Paul actually makes his defense. And you'll notice here in Acts 22, this is Paul recounting his meeting with Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ appeared to him. So this is actually the first recount of his encounter with the Lord Jesus from his own mouth. Because if you remember in Acts 9, when he was on the road to Damascus, that's actually Luke recounting what happened when Paul met Jesus. But this is now a recount of Paul giving a recount to the Jews that are hostile towards him. (coughs) He's making his defense because he's trying to explain to them why he is preaching the things he's preaching and why he's doing the things that he's doing and, you know, trying to make the case. And you'll see some similarities between how we make the case uh, for the gospel today. So let's start off here in in, uh, Acts 22. Verse 1, Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defence, which I I make now unto you. So, Acts 9 was just a recount of what actually happened. But now here he is, a slightly different perspective of the account, because he's defending the fact of why he's doing the things he's doing. Because remember, in Acts 21, he was being accused of like, hey, you know, this is what he's teaching, this is what he's doing. Now, partly it was true, it was probably being mischaracterised, But partly it was true that he was preaching salvation by grace, that he was going to the Gentiles. He was telling the Gentiles that they didn't need to keep the law of Moses. So now he's making the case with his experience meeting the Lord Jesus Christ of why he's doing the things that he's doing. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silent and he said, so remember Paul had this desire to want to try and, you know, be like them as much as possible. And there's that, you know, we talked about in Acts 21, you know, whether we make right decisions or wrong decisions, how much we're willing to compromise, do something that may be lawful but not expedient. And we talked about that before. So here, obviously, he is dressing a crowd of Jews. So speaking to them in their mother tongue, in their, you know, their mother language, the Hebrew tongue, obviously it gets their attention that Paul is speaking to them in a language that is common to them as opposed to just you know maybe the language that is spoken there at the time under the roman empire <coughs> and when they heard that he spake in the hebrew tongue to them they kept the more silence and he said it now one thing you want to note here is this now we see here in acts 22 this whole speech all the way down to i think i believe verse 17 or verse 18 or so what language Is it being spoken in? It's being spoken in Hebrew. But what language was Acts written in? It was written in Greek. So the reason why I think this is an interesting point is because a lot of people believe, or some people believe, that because the King James Bible is a translation, it it can't be perfect. They say, like, oh, translation is never perfect. You always lose some meaning in the translation. Oh, you can't get the exact word that you need, you know, and whatnot, which I, I personally don't believe. I think there is a way to express something in another language that you would, you would express in a different language. You may use different phrases, but then you get the same message across. And, you know, translation is not a science. It's not just like one plus one equals two. You know, you may translate something into another language and it may be said slightly differently, but it's the same words as what would be expressed in a different language. And I think this is proof of that. (coughs) That when the Holy Ghost translates something, it's a perfect translation because Paul here is speaking in Hebrew. 
Well, the Holy Ghost, through Luke, is translating it into Greek. And yet we accept that the Greek words of the New Testament are the perfect word of God. But yet the perfect word of God is providing a translation of something originally written in Hebrew. Uh, there are, and there are other examples of this in the Bible. You know, like when, you know, I mean, Daniel's speaking to, um, you know, his, his brethren in the Old Testament. <coughs> oh, not Daniel, sorry, Joseph, via a translator. Then the question is, well, what language, you know, Joseph's speaking uh, Egyptian. His translator is probably speaking Hebrew to the Israelites. And yet it's, you know, being written down in who knows what language, you know, back in the, uh, you know, when it's being um, originally documented. Obviously in, in uh, Genesis it's being written in Hebrew. But then what was the inspired word? Was the inspired word the word that Joseph was speaking in Egyptian? Was it the word that the Hebrew translator uh, was speaking? Or was it, was it what Moses actually penned down in Hebrew? Well, I believe it's the, what Moses actually penned down is what is inspired scripture. But the point is, inspired scripture contains translations of words in a different language. So it just goes to show that translations can be perfect. And we believe that the King James Bible is a perfect translation into English of the Word of God. So it's not that it can be proven, but it is certainly possible. It's certainly possible for a translation to be perfect. Let's go on. Acts 22 verse 3, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous <coughs> toward God, as ye all are this day. So what Paul now goes into at the beginning of his defense to these Jews is he's now giving a history of himself, his qualifications as a Pharisee, his upbringing, you know, his teachers that they would have known in that city, his relationship with the high priest, him having to get, you know, letters from the high priest, and this zeal that, so it wasn't that it was unknown who Paul was, how he was raised, what he was doing. They knew this, right? So, so Paul was actually some, an influential person and, and knew influential people in that early um, population, that early time, that the Jews would have known as well. And they knew of his zeal toward God. Now, it was an ignorant zeal, like he talks about in Romans 10, but they knew about his zeal, wanting to do what was right by God, but he did it ignorantly in unbelief. As ye all are this day. And he has testimony from Gamaliel, from the high priest, because who he got letters from, to be able to justify the things that he is claiming to this crowd. So he's name dropping them, right? I persecuted this way, and I persecuted this way. Right? So he's not talking about the way in which he's persecuting. He's saying he's persecuting those that believe on, Lord, on the Lord Jesus Christ. That way that they believe. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I persecuted this way unto the death. Right? He's actually killing people, binding and delivering into prisons, both men and women. So you see how zealous he was that his zeal didn't just affect men that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's willing to take women to prison as well. As also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them, which were there bowed unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So it's interesting that you see this different perspective, like I said, of the meeting between Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ, because when you read it in Acts 9, it's very kind of clinical in terms of just historically, you know, Paul breathing threatening to the church, got letters, went here, Whereas here it's very different. He's trying to give the, the reasoning and the, and the sort of his insight into, you know, who he was and the things that he was doing at the time. Now, we see in other passages, <coughs> in like in Hebrews 3, where Paul talks about his history and his upbringing and his zeal as a Pharisee. <coughs> <coughs> Philippians 3, 4, we'll read here. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am all. 
right? So the context in Acts 22 is he's trying to say, hey, this is how zealous I was as a, belief, as, as a Pharisee. Here in Philippians 3, he's going over his qualifications as a Pharisee, but it's because he's saying here, the context is, I'm not trusting the works that I did, you know, and the things that I had in order to gain my salvation. I'm trusting Christ alone. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now Galatians 1, he mentions this as well. Galatians 1.13, For ye have heard of my conversation. So remember in the King James Bible, conversation refers to somebody's manner of life, right? their lifestyle. It's not the, uh, when we talk about like a discussion, we say conversation. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. So it's interesting in Galatians, it's like it's the Jews' religion, it's, not, it's no longer his religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion. So now he's talking about his zeal as a Pharisee and you know, his, his uh, sort of uh, stature in that, that ex former religion that he held to. Above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So what is Paul doing here in Acts 22? Is he's, making, he's, he's basically making the same case that we would today uh, about Paul. It's like, why would a man so zealous an enemy of Christ, right? As a Pharisee, now be such a zealous believer unless the resurrected Christ truly appeared unto him, right? So that's the case that he's making to them because, you know, he's trying to, they're trying to accuse him of this message that he's preached. He's obviously making the claim, hey, I got it from Jesus Christ. But then he's also trying to make the claim that Jesus Christ appeared to him, that Jesus Christ did rise again from the dead. So you see there the argument that he's making there? He's making the argument and saying, look, you know my past. You know how zealous I was. You know who I would learn from and all these things. Why else would I be preaching this message unless Jesus Christ rose from the dead? So this is the case. So it's very similar to the argument that we make. Right? We make the argument to say, hey, Jesus died. His body could not be found. The disciples were willing to die, preaching that he rose again from the dead. But not only those that believed on him, but those that persecuted this way. Right? Also, like Paul, believed on Jesus Christ. Changed. Why? Because the resurrection actually happened. He actually met the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the argument that he's making. So, Galatians 1.23, like he says here, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. So that's how he's using his own testimony. I mean, we use Paul's testimony to say, hey, look, how can there be collusion when there was somebody that wanted to kill them? And he's making that same case. Hey, I believe strongly in that thing. I persecute. The only reason why I changed I'm, I'm used because Jesus Christ actually appeared to me. And this is what he goes into now in Acts 22, verse 6. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus. So we know that Paul <coughs> was on the road to Damascus when Jesus Christ appeared to him. And if you read this alongside Acts chapter 9, it, the, it, it reads very similarly. All the things that he's recounting are all the things that Luke recounted. Because, why? Because Luke wasn't there. Remember, like, Luke joined Paul after Paul converted, right? So Luke wasn't actually there when, you know, when Jesus appeared to Paul. So you can imagine <coughs> that Acts chapter 6, or Acts chapter 9, is Luke just recounting what Paul had told him, right? But he's now quoting here Paul, uh, while well, recounting what Paul described to this hostile crowd in Acts chapter 22. Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. So I won't spend too much time on what actually happens here because we're quite familiar from Acts chapter 9. I'll just point out some differences. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, this is actually recounted in, in different parts of Acts, as in Acts 29 as well, when he's saying it to the governor, and also Acts chapter 9. 
Um, so the recounts are slightly different because some include more information than others and whatnot. And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecuteth. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Now I just want to point out this difference here, because this difference in Acts 22 to Acts chapter 9, people try and attack the word of God by saying there's a contradiction here. But I want to explain to you why it's not a contradiction and why it's just, you know, the way what's being described is being phrased and what it means. So the reason why they say it's a contradiction is because in Acts 22, notice here, it says here that Jesus appears to him, the great light shone round about. And notice here, he says, they that were with me, they saw the light as well. So that light, when Jesus appeared to Paul, they all saw and were afraid. And you remember, they, they all fell to the ground. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So here it's saying, just on a surface level, and I'll explain, I'll explain briefly. So they saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. But then they'll say, oh, it's a contradiction, because in Acts 9, the Bible says, and the men which journeyed with me, him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So the question is, did they hear a voice, or did they not hear a voice? That's the, the sort of the contradiction that I say. They say that one account, they, they uh, heard the voice. On another account, they didn't hear the voice. Now, what I believe is the explanation here <coughs> is that there's a difference between hearing a sound, like when we use the word hear, we would say you heard a, heard a sound. But also the Bible uses the word hear in terms of understanding what is being said. Right? So there's hearing the actual audible sound, and then there's actually understanding what is being said to the person. And this is why it seems like there's a contradiction here, but there's actually two things being said here. So one, in Acts 22, when it says, they heard not the voice of him that spake to me, what I believe is being said there in Acts 22 is, yes, they were there. They heard a voice, but they didn't know what Jesus actually said to me. That he was the only one that actually heard what Jesus had Paul to do. Everyone else just maybe heard, maybe they heard speaking, maybe they didn't understand the language in which it was being said. But then in Acts 9, when it says, and the men which journeyed with me stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So there's a few different explanations. Another explanation is they just heard a voice, but Acts 22, he says, they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So one explanation is only Paul heard the voice of Jesus, and the rest just heard a voice, but not necessarily the voice of Jesus. I believe the explanation is they all heard the voice, but they didn't all understand what Jesus had said to Paul. Paul was the only one that heard what was said to him. Now, either it was because they just couldn't make out what was being said, right? Or they didn't understand what was being said because the people he was journeying with maybe didn't understand Hebrew. And this is where I think we get a hint in Acts 26, verse 14, which is a later account, recount of what happened when he met Jesus. He says here, when we were all fallen to the earth, <coughs> I heard a voice speaking unto me, and look at this, and saying in the Hebrew tongue. So I think we get a hint there that when he's mentioning specifically the language that is being spoken to him, that maybe the others may have heard speaking, but didn't understand what was actually being said to Saul. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against, kick against the pricks. Now I want to show you this passage here in John 8 to show you that the word hearing does not just refer to whether you hear speaking going on, but whether you actually understand what is being said. Jesus says here in uh, John chapter 8, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Look at this. Why do ye not understand my speech? Do you see how this is about understanding what Jesus said? Even because ye cannot hear my word. 
So notice there in the Bible that the word hear doesn't only refer to just being able to hear audibly sounds. Because obviously they can hear the audible sounds coming from Jesus' mouth. But he says, no, because you, you don't understand what I'm saying, because you can't hear, you're not like sort of you know, taking, understanding the words that I'm speaking to you. <coughs> ear of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So, so notice it's not just whether they hear him speak, it's that they don't understand God's word. And that's what I believe, how I believe you rectify that you know, seeming contradiction, Acts 22 and Acts 9, is because in one passage, it's just saying that they heard a voice, but in the other passage, Paul is saying, hey, they didn't understand what Jesus actually said to me when he uses the word here. Let's go on. <clears throat> so hopefully that gives you an answer. If you ever come across that contradiction, you can explain it to somebody. So now there are two things when he meets Jesus, because remember, this, in the context of Acts 22, he's making a case to them of why he's doing the things that he's doing, right? So he talks about his history to say, hey, Jesus appeared to me. Now, what is Jesus actually requiring of him? Well, there's two things required of him. One is, first of all, to get saved. Acts 22, 10, and I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, so remember, he was blinded by the light. After he opened his eyes, he was blind. So he had to be <coughs> excuse me, led by the hand of them that were with me. <coughs> I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers had chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. So again, we're seeing some other words here from Ananias that we don't necessarily see uh, said the exact same way in Acts chapter 9, that Paul was actually appointed to see the Lord Jesus Christ, to be an apostle. As he says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, as one born out of due time, just like the apostles were appointed and sent, Paul also was appointed as an apostle and sent. So he was chosen to know the will of God and to see Jesus, because that's one requirement of being an apostle, is you need to see the risen Jesus. To see that just one, that's Jesus Christ, and should us hear the voice of his mouth. Why? to be a witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So here, it's not teaching baptismal regeneration. I believe it's saying that the washing away of the sins is through calling on the name of the Lord. But, obviously, when people get saved, they get baptized at the same time, as we see many times in, in the Bible. So the first thing required of Paul, required from Christ from, of Paul, is to, be, to understand salvation by grace through works, right? To be saved by calling on the name of the Lord, not saved through the works of the Lord, right? And Jesus Christ obviously being that fulfillment, which is why he's saying to the Gentiles that there's no need to keep those laws. So that's one thing. Acts 22 verse 17, the second thing, is that he was to take that message to the Gentiles. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. So this is now not... So when Ananias spoke to him, right? Ananias told him that, okay, Jesus had appointed him to be a light to the Gentiles. But it's not only there where he gets the message. He's here now returning to Jerusalem. He's in the temple 
And, you know, he's in a trance, like the Apostle Peter. Remember when he went up to the rooftop to pray, fell into a trance, saw a vision? Same thing happening here to Paul. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, <clears throat> for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Now, I was trying to think about what this passage actually says here, because and when I was reading up online a few opinions on this particular verse, it seems like there are different opinions on who the they is here in verse 18. For it says here, For they will not receive thy testimony concerning thee. So some people say that this is referring to believers. All right? Believers, you know, like, like Paul is about to say in the next two verses, well, I persecuted him, they're not going to receive me. Right? Remember when he, uh, even when he went to Ananias? Do you remember in Acts 9 when he went to Ananias? Ananias is like, hey, isn't this the guy that's like killing us? And isn't he got letters from the high priest, you know, to, to put men and people that believe on you in prison? And remember, he was hesitant to receive Paul. So a lot of people think this is what he's talking about here. But if that's the case, you know, when he says, for they will not receive him, why then is, you know, why then is um, Jesus saying to him here to leave Jerusalem? Right, so he's saying, leave Jerusalem. Why? Because they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. He's obviously leaving Jerusalem to go preach the gospel to Christians, to Gentiles, you know? But if they're not receiving his word, why would he send them out from Jerusalem? So I think what he's saying here is he could be referring to actually the Jews and saying, hey, well, I'm sending you out to the Gentiles because the Jews in Jerusalem aren't receiving what you're saying, right? The ones that are persecuting him now. So this is what I think he's referring to here because he's, he's making a defense of why he's come because people are upset that he's at Jerusalem. He's kicking up a fuss. They say, hey, away with him, away with him. But he's trying to make a case to, him, a case to them why he's willing to come back to them because of his testimony because he thinks his testimony has power there that he persecuted the church in time past to prove to them that Jesus Christ appeared to him. So this is what I think he's saying here. I know this is a bit confusing. There's different, different uh, interpretations of these verses. So it says here, And he saw him saying unto me, May case, this is Jesus talking to Paul, Get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. So you see how when you read this, you first think, is he making an excuse for why not to go? But I don't know if I'm reading this differently, but it seems like to me that he's not making an excuse why not to go. He's actually trying to reason with the Lord Jesus Christ why he should stay in Jerusalem. Right? Because he wanted to reach his brethren. Remember, how, remember the love he had for his, 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 his Jewish brethren. And even now he's beaten, he's on the stairs, he's wanting to preach to them. I think that's what's going here, that the Lord wanted to send him to the Gentiles, but he's saying, no, but they know that I had this testimony. They know that I beat up these Christians, you know, and imprisoned them. Even when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. So it's almost like there's this double meaning here, right? Where Jesus wants him to go, and he's trying to say, hey, this is why I would like to stay, because, you know, of the testimony here. But at the same time, you know, there, it's a reason for why those that he's being sent to may not hear him as well. <laughs> all right, let's go on. So there's a few thoughts there in terms of what he's saying to the crowd there. Now, this is all in... Hebrew. Now we go on to part two, which is the Jews' reaction, the Jews, how they reacted to this. Now notice there he ends on Jesus telling him to depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And it's at that word Gentiles where they just had enough. 
right? They don't want to hear anymore. And it's just like this perfectly timed, you know, he ends on the Gentiles and they're like, no, that's it. That's what they want to kill him for because he is reaching the Gentiles. So here's the Jews' reaction in Acts 22, verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word, right? What's the last word he's wrote? Gentiles. And then lifted up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air. So this is their reaction here, the anger from the Jews. Now, now think about this. The anger from the Jews is not that they don't want Gentiles to be reached. They want Gentiles to be reached. But the problem they have is when the Gentiles are being told not to keep the law of Moses. Right? So notice here in Acts 21, that's what Paul is being accused of. When we saw in Acts 21, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews that are there are which believe and they are all zealous of the law. So this is James talking to Paul in Acts 21. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So you see, what was offensive to the Jews is not that he was reaching Gentiles, it's that he was telling Gentiles not to keep the law of Moses. That's what they were upset about in Acts chapter 21. Because they would go to great lengths to try and convert Gentiles, as we read here in Matthew 23, 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. What's a proselyte? That's a Gentile converted to Judaism, right? But they're converted to Judaism to keep the law. And this is why Jesus says here in Matthew 23, and when he is made that Gentile convert to Judaism, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Right? And you can see there in Acts 22 what he's referring to. These people that are so zealous for the law that they are willing to kill people that disagree with them. Galatians 5, look at what he says here in verse 11. And I, brethren... If I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. So what is he referring to? The offense of the cross is that you don't have to do these ordinances. You don't have to do these works in order to be saved. The Gentiles don't need to keep the law of Moses to be saved like circumcision. And this is why it was offensive to the Jews because they were so passionate about keeping the law of Moses that they were upset with Paul that he was doing these things. Well, what's his defense? His defense is the reason why I'm preaching these things to the Gentiles and doing these things is because I was commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the argument that he's making there. Okay? So, that is Paul's defense and what he's trying to explain there and how his story ties in to what he's saying to the Jews. You see their reaction. They're not happy with it anyway, yet he faces the crowd. They still want to kill him. They say, hey, it's not fit that this person should live. Now the last section I want to talk about here, number three, I've titled Rights and Freedoms. Rights and Freedoms. So let's go on to Acts 22. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. So the captain now wants to torture Paul. Bring him in, scourge him, so that we can get answers from him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? So what I want you to see here is, what is happening here now with Paul? So he, he tried to address the crowd, they still want to kill him, yet he addressed them anyway, tried to make his defence. Now the Roman authorities are going to take him into the castle and beat him to try and get answers from him, maybe try and get a confession, false confession, right? Not knowing that he's a Roman citizen. So what is Paul doing here in Acts 22? He is standing up for his rights and freedoms as a Roman citizen. 
So he says here, when the centurion heard that he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. Now, we have verses in the Bible, like 1 Peter 2 and Romans 13, we'll just read them, where people tend to use these verses to say that Christians should just obey any law of human government. Let's, let's read them first. It says here in 1 Peter 2, 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So that's one. But you'll notice here that it always makes the case that you submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So it doesn't remove that hierarchy of authority, that God comes first, right? And then, you know, we try and be a law-abiding citizen. If in good conscience we are doing what's right by God. Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So a lot of people try and use these verses to say, hey, Christians should just be these you know, unquestioning, law-abiding citizens, and just, you know, obey every command of government, whether it's righteous or not, whether it goes against the Bible or not, whether they can do it in good conscience or not. And that's, what not, that's not what these verses are teaching. Because if that's what they were teaching, remember these, you know, one is written by Peter, you know, he went against the authorities. Another is written by Paul, who's, you know, being told to go into the castle and he's about to be beaten. You can say, well, why isn't he just a submissive Christian who's just obeying every ordinance of man to just go in and just get his beaten, beating uncondemned. Well, no, because he, he has rights in Rome, just like we have rights in Australia. And the highest power in Australia is not what some policeman tells you or what some politician tells you. It's the Constitution. It's the laws of the land. We have the rule of law. And even above that, the higher power of the rule of law is God's laws. Right? So that's how Christians decide who to obey, is you have higher powers, you have a hierarchy of authority. We have God, and then you may have the law of the land, and then you have the judges that judge according to those, to those laws. But we can see here in Acts 22, Paul standing up for his rights as a Roman citizen, and it is something that Christians should do. So not only did he stand for his rights, and exercise them as a Roman citizen, right? He knew that he had those rights, right? Because if you don't know you have those rights, then you can't stand up for your rights. So here, he's about to be beaten. If he didn't know his rights, he may have just went along with it. But you see how he says to them here in Acts 22, hey, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? Why? Because he knew he had the right to a fair trial. So, these verses in 1 Peter 2 and Romans 13, they're not teaching, are just blind, blanket submission to human government or representatives of those government, right? Now, what sort of rights and freedoms should we know that we have that are important? It's not just freedom to practice our religion that, drives, that should drive our civic duty. What do I mean by our civic duty? Our, our right, our, our stand to stand up for the freedoms and the liberties that we have in our country. Because some people say, oh, you know what? Oh, well, if they try and get us to sin, that's when you make a stand. But it's not, hey, it's not always that black and white. Because you say, well, is it a sin to skip church every now and then? You know, I know some people here don't think it's a sin, right? <laughs> skip church every now and then. Hey, this is a conscience thing, right? It's a conscience. How often you go to church? Multiple times a week, once a week. It's a tradition that we follow, right? It's not a commandment. It's a commandment to go to church. It's not a commandment how often you go to church. That's a conviction. So when COVID came along, and they say, two weeks to flatten the curve, some Christians just went, oh, law-abiding, you know, we should submit to the government. It's not a sin to not go to church for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, whatever. 
they just stopped going to church. Other Christians said, no, you don't have the right to stop us from going to church and worshipping God. Well, who is right? Or the question is, were they wrong to do that? Well, I don't believe so, right? Because we have to obey God in good conscience, and if we have to go to church to obey God, then we will not be subject to that law. That law is now not higher than God's laws. So same here. Paul knew his rights. He stood up for those rights. It's not just things that stop you from practicing your religion. That should drive you to disobey unlawful commands from the government. Because there are other things that are important to stand up for. Yes, we want the ability to practice our religion. But other freedoms are important too. Right? What about our freedom of speech? I mean, Paul is exercising his freedom of speech here. He was being taken away. But then he said, hey, I, I want to say something. Right? He's exercising his freedom of speech. He's exercising his right to a fair trial. Right? See, so it's not, just, it's not just Paul standing up for his rights to say, hey, I want to be able to go to the synagogue and I want to be able to sing praises to God. I want to be able to read my manuscripts and preach the gospel. He's also just exercising his right to be able to speak to a crowd, you know, unhindered. He's exercising his right here to say, hey, you can't just beat me uncondemned. I have to be before a court and actually be condemned in a trial, right? Which is why at the end of this they say, okay, well, you know, we better hear some witnesses and get a trial together. Eventually they end up, you know, sending him off to, um, uh, unto Caesar to, to be heard. Now I want to show you here we had Paul standing up for his rights. It wasn't just to be able to go to church, exercising his right to free speech, exercising his right to a fair trial. But even Jesus here, when Jesus is with Pilate, you see here Jesus exercising his right to remain silent. You know when police officers arrest you and they say, hey, you have the right to remain silent, they read you your Miranda right, right to remain silent, right to an attorney, all these sorts of things, because... They're saying, yeah, you have a right not to incriminate yourself. You don't have to condemn yourself by your testimony. You can say nothing. It's up to the you know, prosecution to condemn you. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. So this is Jesus now. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall and say it to Jesus. So Pilate's actually concerned, but then obviously he goes and acts in front of Jesus, like, hey, he's a big shot. Saith unto Jesus, whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. So you see how Pilate, as the judge, even presiding over Jesus, is saying, hey, tell me what, what's going on. Tell me, talk, talk to me here. But Jesus disobeys that command. He exercises his right to silence. He, he says, hey, whence art thou? Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Oh, doesn't, that, doesn't that remind you of COVID? It's like, don't you know that I have the power to fine you $5,000, to throw you in jail? You know, take your vaccine. Jesus answered, thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So I want to show you there that in Acts 22, Paul standing for his rights, Jesus there, you know, the right to remain silent. But you know, there are other freedoms. You know, we talked about COVID, but you know, other things happened during COVID as well that were infringement on our freedoms. The freedom of movement. Remember they locked you in your homes? You have the right to move freely. You have the right to go and work. What about the right to your bodily autonomy and not be coerced into being vaccinated just to provide for your family? So there were some rights infringed there too. But remember, there was an argument amongst Christians. Oh, you know, just obey the government, just submit. Is that the right answer, that we just submit to government just when they ask us to do anything? No, because we have to in good conscience 
do what's right by God as well. But then, you know, there are other rights that are worth standing up for as well. What about private property rights? You know, one day the government, you know, in these socialist countries, the government just comes and just takes private property from people. You know, taxation is a form of theft as well, where the government's just taking your hard-earned money and just giving it to other people, which is not right as well. We should be upset about that, and th it's important to fight for those things as well, because, you know, money is power. And when the government takes away the fruit of your labor, they take away your choices. They take away your freedom to make choices when you can't even spend your money the way you want. And you know, what about parental rights? You know, people are getting upset about these things now as well, when they're forcing things in schools, you know, you know, uh, you know, children now wanting to transition and not even, you know, getting the consent of the parents to start them on hormone blockers and puberty blockers and all these sorts of things. Christians ought to stand up for these things and not just to, you know, roll over and take it. So I think it's very important. We see here Paul standing up for his rights and freedoms, and we ought to do the same. Acts 22:28. I just want to finish here. The chief captain answered, look at this, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. See, if you were born, what is Paul saying here? The, the, the captain is saying, hey, he has this freedom as a Roman, but it cost him a lot of money. But Paul is saying here, he was born a Roman citizen. So when Paul was born, he was under the Roman Empire, he was born a Roman citizen. Now, if you were born as an Australian citizen, you may take the rights and freedoms you have as an Australian citizen for granted. But what I want you to know this morning is like we are learning here in Acts 22, that those rights and freedoms you have as an Australian citizen, Australian citizen are extremely valuable. And people that are not freeborn in Australia, they understand the cost of obtaining that freedom, that maybe they came from another country, or if you, you now, if you want to apply for like a spouse visa, marriage visa and all that, I mean back in the day when I got married, you know, 10, 13 years ago, it cost me like five to seven thousand dollars. I think now citizenship by a spouse visa is like ten to twenty thousand dollars or something like that. So you can see what this captain is talking about when he says, with a great sum, obtained I this freedom. Because for people to get the rights and liberties in a certain country, it's not always free, but yet Paul was free born. So the point I want to make here is, and a point I want you to take away is, hey, don't take your freedoms for granted. They're an extremely valuable thing. And the chief captain here, when talking to Paul, he recognized that. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman, because he had bound him. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. So you see him, Paul exercising his rights as a citizen. He then got his fair trial and was able to you know, make his case and even preach the gospel to those that heard his, 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 um, his defense. So you can see here that this whole chapter is about you know, Paul standing up for his rights, standing up for his, and, and defending himself. So the lessons I want you to take away are, one is stand up for yourself. You know, like Paul stood up for himself, he gave his defense. You know, stand up for yourself. Don't, you don't have to be just a walkover as a Christian. You can make your defense, stand up for yourself, and have some conviction behind what you believe. So like with Paul, stand up for yourself, even in the face of adversity. And the second thing I want you to take away from this sermon is, hey, value your freedoms. You know, I know some of us may have been born Australian citizens. We take our rights and our freedoms for granted. And we don't fight for them, right? And if we don't fight for them, one day we'll lose them. So value your freedoms and exercise those freedoms that you have, like Paul did. Just as a wise man once said, muscles are like rights. <laughs> if you don't use them, you'll lose them. All right, let's pray.
Lord, we uh, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the example of Paul. We just learned so much from him in Acts. And uh, Lord, not only you know, should we stand up for the things that we believe in, be able to make a reasoned defense of the things we believe, even in the face of adversity, uh, Lord, may we not take for granted the freedoms that we have in this country, may we exercise those rights, and Lord, may we fight for them, because even though they're not as important as the spiritual work we have to do, they are valuable and important nonetheless. They allow us to live this quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. So Lord, help us not to be ignorant when it comes to our rights as Australians, and Lord, help us to be bold in our witness, even in the face of adversity. We thank you for Paul, thank you for his, this encouragement, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.